This video is kindly sponsored by Fabulous, the number one self-care app to help you build better habits and achieve your goals. Hey, 42 here. If you're fond of reading books about the sea, you might have read the one about a sperm whale called Moby Dick, who's known to eat semen. And no giggling to yourself just because I said sperm and dick and semen in the same sentence. We're all mature adults here. I just can't handle infantile humour. Herman Melville's legendary novel about the Great White Whale was published in 1851, which doesn't seem like a long time ago, but in maritime terms, it was another era altogether. An age when the sea was full of monsters. Unlike today, when the worst you might expect on a ship is bad sunburn and a shortage of rum, the sailors of yesteryear had proper things to worry about. On the 6th of August 1848, around the time Melville was writing about giant spunk whales, Captain McQuahe of the HMS Daedalus, along with several of his officers and crew, spotted a massive serpent in the ocean beside their ship as they sailed from the Cape of Good Hope to St. Helena. Reports from the captain and seven of his colleagues estimated the serpent was around 20 metres long, with at least a metre of its giant snake-like head travelling above the water. Less than a year later, a similar report was published in the Illustrated London News, with details of a serpent that matched the same description being sighted off the coast of Portugal. If you want to avoid those deep-sea beasties, laddie, you best be in good shape. And for that, you need a good, healthy daily routine. So, if you're anything like me, you've probably been finding it tough spending a little longer cooped up indoors the past year than you'd ideally like to be. I, for one, have definitely developed some bad habits, like substituting my daily intake of water for something somewhat higher in proof, and it's best we leave it there. And I've had way too many late nights. I've taken the decision to try to be healthier and take care of myself, so my body takes care of me in the future. So, I'm using Fabulous to add structure to my day and start to factor in time to head out for a walk or to read a few pages of that book that I started six months ago. And most importantly, start to eat and drink healthier. I can tell you I'm drinking significantly more water every day since using Fabulous. It works. Fabulous makes it easy for anyone to develop and stick to healthy habits, thanks to science-backed daily routines. As a result, you'll feel healthier, fulfilled, and more productive. I know I do. Fabulous is different from other self-improvement apps. Firstly, it allows you to go at your own pace. Unlike other self-development apps, Fabulous is gentler, more rewarding, more fun, and has a more supportive approach, meaning you don't have to beat yourself up if you don't hit one of your daily tasks. It's also 100% personalised, tailored to your own needs. Fabulous provides schedules, tasks, and reminders specific to you. It's like having a personal life coach in your pocket. I know that Fabulous has been a positive impact on my routine and general well-being, and it could do the very same for you. You can find out more about the Fabulous app by clicking on the link in the description below. You'll also receive a free week's trial and up to 25% off a Fabulous subscription. So join me and kickstart your journey today. To you and I, these stories may seem ridiculous, but at that point in history, the natural sciences were still young. Charles Darwin wouldn't publish On the Origin of Species for another 10 years or so, and most people had little rational understanding of nature and biology. It was normal for even the more educated seagoing men, like the captain and officers, to believe in sea monsters. In fact, sailors from all cultures were raised on a diet of superstition and tales of terrifying beasts of the ocean. Then again, sea monster was basically just a catch-all phrase which you could roughly take to mean big moving thing in the water we don't recognise. The sea serpent spotted by Captain McQuahe and the men of the Daedalus, for example, is likely to have been a sigh whale. There's nothing monstrous or mystical about these beasts, but they're known to be skim-feeding specialists, meaning often all you see of them is the upper jaw poking out above the water. And hey, you have to admit, it does look a bit weird, 
Another species thought to have been responsible for a lot of sea serpent stories is the giant oarfish, also rather quaintly known as the King of Herrings. These freaky creatures can grow to be 11 meters long, making them the longest bony fish on the planet, and their brightly colored crests give them a distinctly sea serpenty vibe. Again, today we know they're just regular old fish, but back before they were known to science, it's no surprise people thought they were sea monsters. It's also worth remembering we haven't exactly completed the marine pokedex even today. Several thousand new animals are discovered every single year, and the 250,000 or so species we've put a name to so far is thought to be only around 10% of the true number. And it isn't just the small stuff we're yet to collect, we discovered a new species of baleen whale, not so different from the one that played a prank on the crew of the Daedalus just this year in the Gulf of Mexico. Nowadays, we have a new word to describe monsters of the deep, Leviathan. But the term originates in the old Hebrew Bible where it describes a fire-breathing sea serpent that could boil water with its breath. In ancient Greek mythology, the doomed princess Andromeda was chained to a rock by her parents as a sacrifice to a horrible sea creature called Cetus. This piece of work was so nasty, no one could really agree on what it looked like. It was generally thought to be a serpentine monster, though in some versions it had the head of a greyhound and the body of a dolphin, which would be weird enough to scare the crap out of anyone. Luckily for Andromeda, just before Cetus arrived to devour her, the hero Perseus pitched up, fell in love with her and set her free before killing the sea freak. Perseus assumed that stunt would gain him enough brownie points to be able to marry the woman he'd saved, but apparently her parents had already promised Andromeda to her uncle. Jeez, who needs sea serpents when you've got parents like that? Of course, Perseus did what any love-struck lad would do, and slaughtered Andromeda's uncle before marrying the beauty. Also tormenting the Greeks was Scylla, the man-eating monster from Homer's Odyssey. At first glance, she was a total catch, a beautiful woman from the waist up, but things were less pleasant below the belt. And no, I don't mean camel toe. She had 12 tentacle-like legs and a cat's tail, with six dog's heads arranged around her waist. She also had six long snaky necks, each sporting a human head full of shark's teeth, which she used to snatch sailors from their ships as they passed the rocks she lived on. Other ocean monsters from world folklore include the Umabozo in Japan, a black phantom that rises from the calm waters to pull sailors overboard and drown them, and the Eir in Crowen from Scotland that's so big it could eat seven whales in one sitting without getting so much as a stomachache. Even the European myth of the mermaid is darker than you may think. It wasn't always a story of little Disney princesses or Daryl Hannah from Splash. The original mermaids would hypnotize passing seafarers with their enchanting singing and mesmerizing looks, luring them into the water before eating their flesh. And no, not in a nice way. But amongst the many nightmarish tales of what awaits you at sea, one beast in particular seems to crop up across cultures, countries, and traditions more than any other. A massive octopus-like creature with long tentacles, capable of crushing entire ships before dragging them down to the watery depths. The Ainu people of northern Japan revere a giant creature called the Akara Komoi that apparently lives in Akora Bay on the island of Hokkaido, reaching up to 33 meters in length. The Iku Torso of Finland lives in Ohoya, the land of all evil. And while some stories claim it resembles a giant walrus, others paint it with huge suckered tentacles and dragon-like wings that grow when it's angry. Kind of reminds me of one of my exes. Perhaps the most famous eight-tentacled monster of the deep is the Kraken from Norse mythology. It's one of the biggest animals ever imagined by humans, two and a half kilometers in circumference with a mouth the size of a coastal bay. The Kraken hunted the seas between Norway, Greenland, and Iceland 
either by attacking ships directly or creating an inescapable whirlpool that would drag them underwater. The history of the Kraken goes back to an account written in 1180 by King Sverre of Norway, whilst recorded sightings of the beast go all the way back to a 13th century Norwegian text with a title that I'm going to spare from pronunciation-based execution. Yeah. Which includes a detailed description of a mammoth creature that could eat an entire ship's crew in one gulp, and was capable of swallowing whales whole. And to give you an idea of just how much the world has changed in the last few hundred years, even as recently as the 18th century, the Kraken was getting some limelight in mankind's best natural history books. Famous Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus included the Kraken as a species of cephalopod mollusk in the first edition of his groundbreaking Systema Natura, the first book of modern biological classification published in 1735. Up until that point, the description of the Kraken had varied a bit, sometimes even showing up as a colossal crab. But after Cunning Linnaeus published his book, pretty much everyone changed their definition to something along the lines of terrifying big octopus type thing. In later years, the author was embarrassed about having believed in sea monsters and removed the Kraken from future editions of Systema Natura. A couple of decades later, Eric Pontopidon, Bishop of Bergen, wrote what he called the first attempt at a natural history of Norway, in which he shared the gospel truth about the Kraken, including the fact it was the size of multiple land masses, submerged entire ships with the flick of a tentacle, and attracted particularly brave Norwegian fishermen because it was usually surrounded by swarms of fish feeding on its large volumes of excrement. Importantly though, Pontopidon mentions a time in 1680 when a young kraken washed ashore and died near a town called Alstahog. This could be one of the first clues to the true identity of the mythical creature. The kraken has featured in works of fiction like Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Tennyson's poem called, wait for it, The Kraken. It's also made its way into modern popular culture through films like The Pirates of the Caribbean. But to date, it seems nobody has taken advantage of the golden opportunity to give their depiction of the Kraken the name Phil. Phil McCracken? Anyone? No, just me. These days, no scientist with a shred of professional credibility claims the mythological Kraken is a real beast. But we can assume the story originated somewhere in reality. The question is, what animal is the legend based on? One candidate is the giant Pacific octopus, the largest of the octopus species and one that's found in the kind of cold water regions where sea monster stories and homemade vodka often originate. But even with an arm span of up to 8 meters and a reputation for snacking on small sharks, this animal doesn't quite make the gargantuan grade. Another potential beast is the giant octopus, a theoretical animal that has no official biological classification because there has never been any proof of its existence. The main piece of evidence that such a creature may roam the seas is claimed to be the St. Augustine monster, a large blob-like carcass of an unidentified creature found washed up on the US coast near St. Augustine, Florida in 1896. This is one of the first recorded findings of a globster, which is the ridiculous name people give to piles of decaying, unrecognizable organic matter that wash up on beaches around the world. Yes, that's actually a thing. Most globsters have proved to be bits of whale carcasses, but the St. Augustine monster has been more difficult to categorize. With its strange shape and texture, many over the years believed this blob to be the remains of some gigantic form of octopus, including some scientists who conducted tests in the 70s and 80s. But in 1995, electron microscopy and biochemical analysis seemed to show once and for all that the flesh did not belong to a member of the octopus family but was almost certainly the remains of a whale. 
probably the entire skin of one. So much for Octopus Giganteus. There is, however, a real monstrously large creature that would have frightened the salty chaffing pants of ancient mariners, the giant squid. The first known reference to this big chunk of calamari dates back to 4 BC and Aristotle, who spoke of a type of squid that was much larger than others of its kind. Pliny the Elder also had a bit to say on the matter in the 1st century AD, describing a massive squid with arms 9 meters long and a body weighing 320 kilograms. After that, things went pretty quiet, apart from the occasional sighting of a man-eating sea monster, until the 17th century, when a carcass found in Iceland became the oldest certified record of a giant squid. It wasn't until 1857 that Japetus Steenstrup first classified the creature, and even today, sightings remain incredibly rare, with most of what we've learned having come from specimens washed up on beaches, particularly in New Zealand and Newfoundland. By the turn of the 21st century, we still did not have one photograph of a living giant squid. But that changed in 2002, when the first image of a live specimen was caught on camera at Goshiki Beach in Japan. In 2004, a massive 8-meter character was photographed, hunting at 900 meters below the surface, off Japan's Ogasawa Islands. The first moving images of a small specimen were captured in 2006, and finally, in 2012, a film crew from the Discovery Channel and the Japanese network managed to lure a mature adult giant squid of about 10 meters in length and film it feeding for almost 25 minutes. Despite the excitement around these photos and film footage, we still know bugger all about these beasts. We know they live deep, but we're not exactly sure how deep. We don't really know how they find a mate, how they hunt, how long they live for, where they lay their eggs, or how many there are. We aren't even quite sure just how big they can get, but extrapolation based on what we know so far suggests the biggest could be a frankly absurd 25 meters long or more. Though admittedly most of that is just tentacle. Still, it isn't hard to imagine glimpses of these deep sea monsters from the decks of ships could have spawned the Kraken myth. But if that sounds like one scary squid, you'd better sit down. Because the giant squid is actually kind of a weed compared to its big brother. The imaginatively named Colossal Squid. Only discovered in 1925, these titans of the abyss are admittedly a little shorter than their giant siblings, but they're much, much girthier. The chodes of the squid world, if you will. Whilst the heaviest giant squid are thought to come in at around 275 kilograms, colossal squid are as much as three times that weight, and they sport the largest eyes of any animal on the planet, at roughly the size of a large human head. All the better to scare the crap out of you with. But whilst both giant and colossal squid look pretty fearsome, they don't actually represent the top of the food chain, as both are preyed on by Moby Dick and his spermy mates. In fact, it's thought the environmental pressure from sperm whales was the evolutionary driver behind the development of those disturbing dinner plate eyes. You see, thousands of meters down where these guys live, even giant eyes aren't actually all that much use. Next to no light makes it down that far. But the world's biggest peepers do help these monstrous squid detect extremely large shapes. For example, the kind of supersized silhouettes owned by sperm whales. This deep sea rivalry is often depicted as a kind of battle of the titans. You might have seen the impressive diorama of the two in a fight to the death that hangs in the Museum of Natural History in New York. But in reality, it's very much a one-sided fight. In fact, sperm whales eat these squid for breakfast, both literally and figuratively. A lot of what we know about both giant and colossal squid comes from remains, particularly their mouthpieces, known as beaks,
found in the stomachs of sperm whales. By some estimates, colossal squid make up as much as 75% of the sperm whale's diet by mass. Still, the squid are known to put up a fight on the way down, because plenty of sperm whales have been found covered in sucker marks from both giant and colossal squid. Colossal squid are also candidates to be the inspiration for the kraken, but the giant squid is probably a better fit, as colossal squid prefer to congregate around the Antarctic. And by congregate, I mean socially distance with miles of empty ocean between them. To be honest, we don't know if that's true either, since we have no evidence of them in their natural habitats, and none of them use Instagram. So, whilst there may not be any real sea monsters left in our 21st century oceans, for my money, some of the regular old animals down there are almost as good. Thanks for watching.